let's get back to how that structure develops. So there's four levels of protein structure. Um, these are always referred to uh, on and on in, in biology. Um, used to see them a lot on AP exam free response questions. It's up for grabs now. We'll talk about that as we keep going through the year. In any event, four levels, one, two, three, four, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Not all proteins have quaternary structure, but all of them pretty much get up to tertiary structure. So you can think about, um, let's, that, that they, they increase in complexity as you go up here. Um, primary structure is simply the sequence. So your DNA codes for the amino acid sequence. We haven't talked about that yet, but your DNA or DNA is the blueprint. It's read in three letter codons. We'll get into that in gory detail in a little while. Um, and it dictates which amino acid goes. And the order of amino acids is going to dictate the shapes that they'll be able to take on later. So basically the um, amino acids are put together um, that carbon binds to the next nitrogen. Here's our central carbon, carboxy again, and this carboxy is going to bind to the next amino acid. Just uh, saw here that I don't have a slide that really talks about the peptide bond. I'll do this in class. I think it's something best drawn on the board anyway. Suffice it to say that the connection between that carbon and that nitrogen and the next one is called a peptide bond. It's a covalent bond. They just give it a special name because it's two amino acids. So the primary structure comes from your DNA. It gets um, translated into the sequence of amino acids that gets put together in the ribosome. And we'll hear about that later. You usually talk about the amino end, that end terminus, and then it goes in a very strict direction this way and um, ends with the carboxy terminus or that C double bond OOH. So after you get the um, primary sequence together, you get secondary structure, and let's look at that a little closer. So not all proteins have all of these. Um, most do, but there are plenty that actually don't have any secondary structure or, beta or um, alpha helices or beta pleated sheets. They just have tertiary structure, but a lot of them do. Some of them have only alpha helices or secondary, this type of secondary structure. So there's two kinds. Alpha helix is basically a coil. Its structure was determined by Linus Pauling. We're going to bring him up again a little later. Um, big, important biochemist in the early 1900s. Seems like such a long time ago. Anyway, the alpha helix um, makes this nice coil. I like to think of a telephone cord, and I'll show you that example in class. Beta pleated sheet is basically running anti-parallel. There's going to be something, oops, I can't point at the screen, um, something else going on in these absent parts here, but then maybe there's something going on over here, and then it comes back this way, and it interacts. The key thing between these two and why they're lumped together in the same category as secondary structure is how they are chemically held together. They are both chemically held together in these shapes by hydrogen bonds. And the hydrogen bonds are made, and the reason why we have this emphasized here with this purple ribbon going on here and the light purple going on here, the ba NCC backbone, so that amino acid backbone, regardless of the R groups, is what's going on here. The hydrogen bond is made between the um, uh, oxygen on one and the hydrogen on another amino acid, and they're attracted across. So they only make that shape because of the primary sequence that throws them in this confirmation that it's thermodynamically stable to make the hydrogen bonds. But the hydrogen bonds are only made across that um, backbone. Similarly, beta pleated sheet, you can see a little better here. So let's see, we got NCC, right? And that carbon's got the double bond to oxygen, NCC. Remember, both nitrogen and oxygen are uh, a polar or they're electronegative, so they can have a polar covalent bond. So what you see here, this strand's going this way, this strand's going this way. The oxygen of this strand can be hydrogen bonded to the hydrogen on that nitrogen down below. And similarly, the oxygen on that lower strand can be hydrogen bonded to the hydrogen on that nitrogen above. Again, the bonds are made between the atoms on the backbone. I emphasize that because it's different in tertiary structure. So you think, think, and I'll show you again with the telephone cord. We're going to have these coils wound up, and then they're going to fold back on themselves to make this final globular structure. Sometimes it's real globular, sometimes it's real linear, it's all different things. Um, tertiary structure is now the interactions, and they put here an alpha helix. These arrows are always beta pleated sheets. 
and then they fold up together to make this final structure. So what holds these together? Now it's the R groups actually participating in some chemical bonding. And again, we can see our um, uh, functional groups we talked about before. So we can make hydrogen bonds, again, between an OH of one side and maybe an oxygen on another side, and they're grabbed together across a pretty large space usually. Hydrophobic interactions and van der Waals interactions are basically um, ways to describe the hydrophobic groups excluding anything charged away from them and kind of hunkering down together. It's a more complex interaction of um, the way the electrons are hanging out there, which we're not going to get into in the scope of this course. Um, you can make full-on ionic bonds. The negative charge from an acidic R group can be attracted to the positive charge of a basic R group, and those can be held together like that. And then a very strong bond that gets made, and this has to be made by an enzyme in the um, in the ER, and we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks, is a disulfide bond. So the hydrogen gets ripped off of that sulfhydryl group, the hydrogen gets ripped off of that sulfhydryl group, and now we make a bond, covalent bond, attracting the two finally results in this sort of glob-shaped thing. Whoops, didn't realize I was going to zoom in on that. Okay, so um, last one is quaternary structure. Again, not all proteins have this. It's more than one polypeptide being brought together to do a job. This is called the transethrin protein. This has two subunits being attracted to each other, two globs kind of holding together to make a final structure. Collagen is three strands of alpha helices wrapped around each other to make that nice spongy stuff in your nose. So let's talk about um, a great example that's been worked out for um, quite a while called hemoglobin, critical for life. We know that it's the molecule that is in red blood cells and carries oxygen to our tissues and um, facilitates the CO2 transport out to the lungs too. We'll talk about exactly how CO2 goes multiple ways later on, but hemoglobins in red blood cells. Um, hemoglobin's been worked out um, its crystal structure, so we know that it has this shape. We know where the heme group sits. The heme group is a coordinated chemical group that um, is attracted to these alpha helices here and in the center of it, it has an iron molecule that's held there by the bonding between the nitrogens. And it's actually the iron that helps to participate in the oxygen, um, carrying the oxygen. So um, there are four subunits in hemoglobin, two of the same. So there's two purple ones and two teal ones. Each one carries a heme group. So a final tertiary structure of a hemoglobin can carry four oxygens zooming in on that. And here's just another picture. Gives you a little bit different representation of it. Um, here they color code each um, each subunit and is a different color just to emphasize their differences. And you can see the alpha helices. So this is mostly made up of alpha helices and then um, the tertiary structure is those alpha helices being brought together. So why do we care so much about hemoglobin? Well, it's it allows for life basically in humans and other mammals. Um, but we also know of a very specific amino acid um, mutation. So it's a mutation that happens at the level of the DNA that changes this fifth amino acid in um, the beta subunit. So normally it's a, a glutamine and it gets changed to a valine. And that's a pretty big change. It changes it from um, a polar um, amino acid to a, a nonpolar one. And what happens is normally the four subunits of hemoglobin pack in like this and they um, they don't associate with each other in the red blood cell. They're, they're dissolved and they carry their oxygen. Everybody's happy. You have a nice red blood cell shape, this biconcave donutty looking thing. Um, what happens with when that valine is there, it changes the shape of the beta subunit into kind of this hooked thing. And basically the sickle cell hemoglobin, so one DNA base change results in amino acid change. We'll talk about how that happens. Changes the shape completely of this beta subunit. So half of it can carry oxygen happily. Half of it is not so good. And then, and even worse, um, when the person is stressed with lower oxygen levels, it crystallizes. So it makes this fiber. It spontaneously um, assembles into this this fiber, which makes the structure of the red blood cell look sickle shaped, which is where they got the name from. This guy cannot slip through capillaries as easily as this guy. 
very tiny blood vessels that you need to go feed your tissues clogs up you end up getting all kinds of problems number one from not carrying your oxygen around correctly but also from these sickle um, cells getting clogged up in your in your kidney and your liver and all other places that blood flows through it's a very bad disease we're going to use this particular disease and this particular gene mutation several times during the year to um, as an example for many different things that we'll be talking about and then very lastly um, it's pretty amazing that proteins can almost self-assemble into this some self-assemble completely some need some help of enzymes that are in the ER and the Golgi and we'll be talking about those in the next couple of weeks when we talk about parts of the cell um, but it's pretty cool that there are some that can be denatured or completely unwound um, maybe with heat breaking the hydrogen bonds maybe um, with a change in acidity and then they can be allowed to renature if you allow them to do that most proteins if you denature them <clears throat> for example in a test tube or treating the protein with some kind of chemical they don't go back they really do need the help of the cell and the parts of the cell and the enzymes in there to do that but this picture is just to show you that um, proteins some in parts of them inherently have the um, chemical ability to reassemble and then the next one's going to be uh, nucleic acids so we'll stop there.